The giver of life was he, that my Lord was despised and rejected of men, this Jesus of Calvary, 134, and after that we do 7. <laughs>
87, the old rugged cross, 87. On a hill far away, <coughs> the old rugged cross, emblem of suffering and shame. For the dear Lamb of God, and I love that old cross for the dearest and best, for a world of lost sinners was sent. Page 87. <coughs>
so thrilled with Jesus, chorus 219. I get so thrilled with Jesus, and what we do.
so that even in the smallest manner, we can feel and understand really what the Lord did for us. See, if we lose that, if we don't have that desire, this becomes just another day. And that's, of course, what has happened in the world. For many, this is just another day. Good Friday, they know the name, they might even perhaps know what is being commemorated on this day, but that's where it stops for the majority of people. And the danger is that that leaks into our lives, and we can't allow that to happen. And so we have to always ask God His Spirit to help us in some way, shape, or form. I think about John as God was giving him this revelation of heaven, and he tries, by God's leading and guiding, to provide us with a description of what that is like, and yet, I'm sure, I'm sure, that it's nowhere like the actual experience. Or think about the trips you've been on, and the photographs that you look at after. <laughs> And how, I've often found, the picture does no justice to those mountains that you saw, or the valleys that you saw, or the structures that you saw. It's nothing like being there. And so, when we look at God's sacrifice of His Son, and Jesus' sacrifice, um, I want this morning to take a, a few minutes to understand that, to try and under, understand that a little bit better. First thing we have to remember is what is a sacrifice. Definition is not that difficult, right? But the important piece of this is the giving or offering of something precious. So a sacrifice is only a sacrifice if what you are giving is precious, right? I mean, if you come to my house and I give you something that I don't want, that's a piece of junk as far as I'm concerned, that's absolutely no sacrifice. I gave it, and you might be happy, but that's not what a sacrifice is about. And so, the most precious sacrifice that could be given was Jesus. And that's because we believe and understand, as the scripture says, Jesus is God come in the flesh. See, if he's just a man, well, how many billions of men, women, and children have died? So, is that such an amazing sacrifice? This had to be a sacrifice above and beyond anything that anyone could give. Now, I'm often amazed, and I, we can read in the Old Testament of the sacrifices that people gave. And you know, I'm, the reason I'm amazed is they talk about not just one goat or one bullock or one lamb. They talk about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of lambs and goats and bullocks that were sacrificed at one event. As people were trying to show their love and show their honor and show their respect, by giving as much as they could. Nothing that they did is anywhere close or equal to what God gives in His Son, what Jesus bears and what He gives. There's a saying, and I don't always look at these, but this one I thought was rather interesting. It says, there are three things you can do with your life. Three things you can do with your life. You can waste it by living selfishly, you can wreck it by living sinfully, or you can give your life away by living sacrificially. And Jesus exemplifies that as he gives his life away as a sacrifice for each and every one of us. This morning I'm not going to try and convince you that it was a sacrifice. You know, I, my message this morning and often, I think, as a pastor, as a preacher, you have to look at your audience. I don't see anybody here that needs to be convinced of the gift of salvation. Reminded? That's good for all of us. But convinced? No. 
if we had somebody here this morning who'd come in off the street, so to speak, and I wasn't sure about how much they knew about what the Lord had done for us, then we'd spend a lot more time looking at that gift of salvation and how that comes about. But we understand that. So let's go a little bit deeper into really how much of a sacrifice it was for Jesus to willfully die for you and for me. So the first thing we have to look at is who is Jesus? And I've already mentioned to you that we understand, right? But it's important that we look at the Word of God. I'm in John chapter 1. Let me give you three verses just so that, and again, these are good verses, you know, if you take notes or you want to, you're speaking to somebody who doesn't know what is Good Friday? What's the big deal? So here's this guy, you know, and he dies, you know, for his beliefs and, and what he stands for. And then they'll point to all kinds of other people. Well, first we have to understand who Jesus is. And I'm giving you this because I want to emphasize the relationship with Jesus and God. Okay? What is that relationship? So the first thing in John chapter 1, and again, verses we know, John chapter 1, just verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we recognize that Word, that being referred to there, is Jesus, right? And so, again, somewhat challenging for us to comprehend the Trinity. And yet, what we have to remember here is that Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit are one and the same. So there, there can't be a closer relationship than that oneness that Jesus felt with the Father. Because they are one. Okay? So when we talk about Jesus, we have to remember that. And that is important when we get a little bit later here into the sacrifice. A little bit further, a little bit further in John. Go to John chapter 10. These references are all in John. John chapter 10. I'm going to start reading at verse 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Verse 30, I and my Father are one. Again, reinforcing that connection. And that's the piece here that I want to show you. And one more verse in John chapter 17. John chapter 17, beginning at verse 23. John 17 and 23. I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. This particular section not only again speaks about that connection, the Father and Jesus and Jesus and them, but it also reinforces Jesus' desire for that same relationship to exist for us. And in this particular, that last example that I gave you, those verses, talk a lot about God's love. So the relationship, the bond, I'm trying to imagine that bond, that closeness, right, where you have two separate entities, yet one, and the love that Jesus says he feels from the Father and his love for the Father is all really important for us to remember 
as we move and we start to see the events unfold of the crucifixion. So keep this in mind. Next, we want to see much, how much of a burden was Jesus carrying? You know, we talk about the iniquity, we talk about all of those things. Jesus gives us a little bit of an inkling of this when he's in the garden. And so turn to Mark chapter 14. We have to remember here that part of the sacrifice that Jesus makes, he actually already has made when he leaves heaven. Right? Imagine for a moment, right? You are King of kings and Lord of lords. You're with the Father. The two are one. You're in glory where there is no pain, no darkness, no sorrow, nothing of that nature. And then the plan unfolds and God decides he's going to send a part of him. He's going to send himself in the form of flesh called Jesus to this world that is full of pain and sorrow and hunger and you name it, all of these things, right? So I, what I want to show you here is that Jesus, as he comes in the flesh, has already made a great sacrifice for every one of us. And that sacrifice continues when in his fleshly form, he tries to bear the sins and the iniquities, not just of one person, not just of a few people, but of all people for all eternity. Now again, my mind, that's, I can say that, I just said that to you. Right? But to actually understand that, I can't. I'll be honest with you. I can't, I can't understand what that must have felt like. Right? I mean, every one of us has probably had an experience where we felt guilty about something. Right? Can you think about something that you felt guilty about? You felt sad, you felt poorly about something that you have done. You knew that there was something wrong and how that weighed on you. Perhaps you couldn't sleep at night, you were tossing and turning, you couldn't find joy. Right? And that's from maybe one thing that you did. And Jesus takes upon himself, not just, well, not at all, his own sin. Because the Bible tells me he was without sin. So once again, can you see, that's a continuation of the sacrifice that he makes, right? Not only does he sacrifice to leave heaven, but now this man, God in shape of a man, who has not sacrificed uh, sinned at all, voluntarily takes upon him all those sins. And we see some of that weight displayed, as I said, in the garden. So I'm in Mark chapter 14. And let me start just reading at verse 33. Mark 14, verse 33. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed, and to be very heavy. See, he's already starting to feel the burden, okay, that he's carrying. And I mean, this isn't a natural burden, obviously. He doesn't have a package, right? This is inwardly, he's starting to feel that burden. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Now, again, I'm not preaching about that particular piece, but I'm trying to put it into a context for you. Okay? Again, pray, ask the Lord to help to show us and me and you how much of a sacrifice that was. Right? See, the natural part of Jesus, and again, we can, I, I try to imagine, and this is the piece that's difficult, right? What it must have been like for Jesus as he's growing up, he knew the scriptures. He 
went to the synagogue. He was taught, and he knew them before that. He could have taught them better than anybody was there. He knew what the Old Testament speaks about, about the death, the sacrificial lamb. He knew all of those things as he was growing up. And as he begins his ministry, he knows that the day is coming when he will be in great sorrow, when he will be, as it says there, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Right? Like he, I, we can't really understand, but it gives us an idea here that even for Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, this is a tremendous burden. And as I talk about all these things and as we read them, remember he did this for you. <clears throat> and then think about who you are. Think about who I am. And how we're nothing compared to the King of kings and Lord of lords. The one who spoke all things into existence. The one who has been there from all through all eternity. Who had never experienced death or pain or any of those things until he came in the shape of a man in this imperfect body. And yet, he does all of that and the weight is tremendous upon him here. Okay? Because he knows what's coming. And he's willing, right? even though he asks, you know, and he says, all things are possible unto thee. And so the burden that he's feeling, this Savior, is tremendous as he goes to the cross. This is part of the sacrifice that Jesus carries for each and every one of us. One more piece that we need to look at before we get to the main part of the message this morning. And so turn with me to Luke Luke chapter, sorry, 16. In Luke chapter 16, we get um, what I believe to be the most tormenting and difficult part of what hell is. And this is leading again to the sacrifice that Jesus makes. In Luke chapter 16 we have this description as Jesus is speaking and he teaches and I'm going to pick this up in verse 22. It says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, and he, uh, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. So we have a physical torment that is happening there. But let's continue. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, and this is, I believe, to be the most important piece, and besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they would, which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. You see, hell not only has a physical torment, but involves a separation from God. You have to consider that. Okay. A separation from God. <coughs> what is that? What would, must that be like? To be separated from God the Father. Like, think about it even for ourselves. Like, we're all blessed if we've been saved and we're born again. Part of that is that renewing of that relationship that we have with the Father. And so he's someone, who we, you know, we sing, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he walks with me, and all these things. Talks about a fellowship that we have with God, with Christ. And in hell, that is severed. There is no 
fellowship. There is no feeling of peace. There is no feeling of rest. There is no joy. Where do those things really come from? I hope by now we understand all of those blessings, they don't come from material things. They come from the Lord. And so the separation from God is a torment to our soul. Is a torment to our soul. And so in this description, it speaks about this gulf. It speaks about that separation. And that separation from the Lord is the greatest sacrifice that Jesus makes when he goes to the cross. Let me explain. And my title for this morning is Our Forsaken Savior. Because in two sections of scripture, Jesus speaks about that he has been forsaken. And so the first example here is in Mark, you go back to Mark, chapter 14. Back to the garden. Okay. And in Mark chapter 14, we have the events of the garden. And we start to see Jesus' natural followers starting to fall away. It starts to be demonstrated when those that go to the garden with Jesus can't stay awake. Right? So, you know, that really gives an impression to me that they are not comprehending what Jesus is about to go through. See, that, that's the same struggle that we have, right? Even though they were right there, they couldn't stay awake and watch. They, they weren't able physically, right? Their bodies gave out on them because they were in a natural sort of place. So they, they weren't even praying with Jesus. They fell asleep, okay? So that's the first indication. And then as the... Um, events unfold and Judas comes and the, and the betrayal takes place, jump down to verse 50 in chapter 14. It's a very straightforward, small little verse, and it says, And they all forsook him and fled. So the first thing that we see here is that every natural support is taken away from Jesus. Right? He goes into the judgment by himself. He suffers all the pain by himself. There is no one there to try and encourage him. There is no one there to lift him up. They all fled. They all, a much more powerful word is that word forsook. They left him behind. They took off. That's the natural piece. That would be tough enough for all of us. But the piece, I believe, that is the most painful, again, the great, greatest sacrifice, not only the bearing of the sin, the bearing of the iniquity, but what does Jesus really bear for each and every one of us? Go to Mark chapter 15. Looking at the crucifixion, just a portion of it, beginning in verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, and look at this very, very carefully, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So let's go back to the beginning. Who's Jesus? What relationship does the Bible tell us that he has with God the Father? We saw the verses, right? God, the Father, and Jesus are one. So now, at this point, this great point of sacrifice, Jesus cries out, My God, my God, look at my hands, why hast thou 
forsaken me. That's something for us to consider. That's something for us to pray about. When someone forsakes you, the loneliness, the emptiness that we feel in the natural, right? But imagine now when, because it's a sacrifice, right? It's, God has set this in motion that Jesus has to pay the highest possible price for you and for me. He takes our sins, He takes our iniquities, and now He takes them alone. He's no longer connected. At that very moment, the connection between the Father and the Son is broken. When, it's, when he says, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus is feeling something there that none of us can comprehend. None of us can comprehend. Because his unity and his bond with God the Father is also truly beyond our comprehension. Right? The Bible tells me they are one. And they love one another. And yet at that moment, right here, right at that moment, Jesus feels the ultimate sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice. To be separated to be forsaken by his Father. And he does that for you, and he does that for me. And how unworthy are we? How unworthy are we? Not only of the natural agony that Jesus goes through, the physical things that he had to bear, the pain of having the nails driven through his hands, and historically, you know, we can look at the history of mankind, so to speak, and the atrocious, barbaric things that people do to one another. Unimaginable things. Unimaginable things. Done to Jesus. He bore those things. Then spiritually, he takes the sin, he takes the iniquity, he bears all of our burdens, carries them upon himself, so that he feels that heaviness in his soul, as he said, unto death. And now he's hanging on the cross, hanging on the cross, being mocked. And as the moment of death, his natural body shutting down approaches. See, salvation, look at it this way. As God's children, when we know we're saved, we don't fear death. Right? I mean, we know it's coming. But we don't fear death. Why don't we fear death? Think about it. Why, as a child of God, have we no reason to fear death? For me, it's because He walks with me. It's because God is going to be with me in that moment. It's because the Scripture tells me that God is with me. I don't have to be afraid of death. Because I'm not alone. And as a child of God, God's not going to forsake me in that moment. If I'm saved, I'm born again, I'm one of His. He's there to help me through every situation. And look what Jesus had to bear. Look what Jesus had to bear. To, for Him to cry out. And again, I can't really, I, don't, I can't comprehend it fully. <coughs> But I, I just point it out to you so that you pray about it and ask the Holy Spirit to give a glimpse, just a touch, 
to help us to understand so that the day that we remember that Jesus died on the cross, that we don't just think about, oh, this poor man, all oh, the pain he must have borne when the thorns were put on his head and they beat him and they hammered the nails and they did all of those different, different things. Oh, the suffering he must have gone through. It's more than that. It's more than that. Much, much more. And as God's people, we have to make sure we don't forget it. Because in a few days, after this, we celebrate a resurrection. And we talk about the victory, but we must remember the price that was paid. And every day, that we are able to wake up every day that we can say, thank you, Lord, for the strength for today. Thank you, Lord, for the sunshine and that I can go outside. And yes, it was cold today, but you know what? Praise the Lord, I felt the cold. This may be a different way of looking at it, but it's something to thank God for. It means we're still alive. This means we still have another day to thank God, or maybe another hour, we don't know. But we have more time to worship Him, and to thank Him, and to remember what He did. And the reason that we can do that different than the world, with joy and strength and overcoming power, is because regardless of everything that Jesus went through, He does overcome. He does have a victory. And it is that great pain and suffering that he feels that then erupts into a victory that, again, none of us can truly comprehend, but we can feel a part of that. And we can rejoice in what God has done for us. But his sacrifice, remember the verses, consider what they say. And what that means for the Lord to say, why hast thou forsaken me? Let's not forsake him. Let's be faithful and true. God will never forsake us. Imagine that. If we stay true, and I'll close on this, if we stay true and we stay faithful and we walk the path that the Lord has told us to walk, which he will help us with every step of the way. I, if I can do that with God's help, I will never need to say, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me? I won't have to say that. Because Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, I thank you, dear Lord God. We stand before you in the flesh. We are mortal. And it's so very, very difficult for me, perhaps others are more blessed, but it's difficult for me to comprehend how great a sacrifice you truly made. But I'm thankful, Lord, that your word provides us with indications. Your word helps us to get closer to understanding. And most importantly, Lord, the Holy Spirit can give us not only a glimpse of heaven, but can show us what it cost so that that is our eternity. And so, dear Lord Jesus, on this day, as we have gathered together to give you praise and to thank you, thank you, thank you for what you have done, Help us not to be like the world. Help us not to take your sacrifice for granted. Help us not to frame your sacrifice in a way that we can understand and say, oh, it must have been painful, oh, it must have been this. I have no idea what it must have been like. What I do know, it was greater than any sacrifice that could be made. Imagine, Lord. I'm trying to imagine, help me to feel and understand and to remember your sacrifice. This was the greatest, that means there is no greater ever, 
sacrifice that was made. And you did this for us. And so, Lord, my prayer is the least that we can do is to remember what you did and thank you for what you did and live a life that magnifies you so that others may also have the opportunity to thank you for the gift of your sacrifice. Be with us the rest of this day and help us to gather together in your name again this evening, I ask. In your precious name. Amen.